Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's great to see you all here today. Uh, thank you for joining us on this weekly walk. Now, today, in celebration of Pride Month, uh, we're actually going to be examining the LGBT history and landscape of Central Park over the decades. And as such, we'll uh, discuss some of the individuals that have used Central Park as a uh, backdrop for uh, their political activities. Now, before, of course, we uh, continue on with our walk, let's go ahead and uh, talk about uh, uh, the Zoom controls real quick. So all participants are muted, uh, but you can use the chat feature to say hello and comment. If you have any uh, questions, you can use the Q&A function. And my colleague Desiree is on the back end. Uh, she'll answer any uh, inquiries that you folks might have. Uh, closed captioning has also been enabled as well, uh, but you can turn them off by simply pressing the live transcript button and then pressing hide subtitles. Now, the images that you folks will see today were taken from a variety of different sources, such as the Library of Congress, the New York Public Library, uh, the archives of the uh, Central Park Conservancy, among many others as well. So, of course, our mission here at the Conservancy is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well-being of all. And of course, we've been uh, hard at work since 1980. All right, so on our walk, uh, today we're going to be looking at some of the many uh, gay, lesbian, and queer folks that have had a hand in influencing the park landscape uh, within the past 165 years. And today, of course, I have, uh, hope to shed some light on this history. Now, the park, of course, was designed as a, an open democratic space. So around the uh, perimeter of the park, there's going to be about 20 of these named gates. Each one is named after specific groups of New Yorkers, like Merchants Gate, Farmers Gate, Artists Gate, as opposed to individual politicians or war heroes. So in Central Park, there is no George Washington Gate or there's no Thomas Jefferson Gate uh, or whatever else. And so I think this uh, language of openness really influenced later generations of park goers. Now, uh, LGBT folks have been present in New York City since the very beginning. It was, of course, regarded as, as taboo, uh, especially by the Victorian era, but in places like the Bowery, Greenwich Village, Harlem, and Times Square, uh, LGBT folks started forming their own communities and organizations. And that would especially be the case by the 1900s. So you'd see things like gay bars and aid societies and other spaces really start to emerge that would cater to young gay men and lesbians, help them look for not only romances, but also jobs and careers, especially for those just moving into the city for the very first time. The photo that we're looking at, by the way, this is actually uh, by the photograph or by the photographer Alice Austin, who documented some elements of the lesbian subculture of New York City, and especially in her native Staten Island, where she grew up uh, in the late 1800s. Now, as a resource that was uh, easily accessible by pretty much uh, everybody in the city, parks were an important element in the lives of uh, folks in the queer community, as of course they still are today. Uh, parks really became the backdrop for the uh, political activities of gays and lesbians. So by the 1970s, you start to see protests, rallies, uh, and things called gay inns uh, at Sheep Meadow here in the park. Now, the spirit of activism would really continue through the modern day. And actually, just last month, the park uh, held the annual AIDS walk, which is conducted every year by the Gay Men's Health Crisis. All right, so with that very long uh, introduction, let's go ahead and uh, uh, take a look at the map. So we're going to start off from right here at uh, Bethesda Terrace and Fountain, and then we're going to work our way right down the mall. We're going to explore some of these statues and monuments in this particular area. And then we're going to head west uh, towards Sheep Meadow, make our way up towards Cherry Hill, and then west uh, ending off our tour, our walk, over at Strawberry Fields. Um, let's actually go ahead and act, uh, start off right here at the center of the park uh, over at Bethesda Fountain. Now, this area, of course, uh, we've been through here many, 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 many times before. Uh, unofficially, this is called the heart of Central Park, and with good reason, of course. Um, this is actually one of the very few formal landscapes that was designed by Vox and Olmsted in their bucolic rural vision for Central Park. Um, it was basically crafted by the sculptor Emma Stebbins uh, in the 1860s, and of course the statue would be unveiled by 1873. Now, according to some accounts, the angel's face is actually modeled after the artist's lover, Charlotte Cushman, who was already quite a famous celebrity by the time that the statue was unveiled. 
So Charlotte Cushman was generally regarded as one of the leading stage actresses of her day. She was a contralto, so she had this incredible vocal range, and she was able to play both male and female roles. In fact, one of her more famous roles was as Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. She was also friends with a lot of very powerful figures like the Secretary of State at the time, William, Stew uh, William Seward, as well as President Abraham Lincoln himself, who was actually said to be a big fan of her work. Now, um, uh, Charlotte Cushman and uh, Emma Stebbins, they actually first met in Rome, Italy back in 1857, where there was this uh, large uh, expat community of American lesbian artists that centered around Cushman and her circle of friends. Now, there were other famous women involved in this art scene as well, including the writer Matilda Hayes and the sculptors Harriet Hosmer and Edmonia Lewis. Uh, and by all accounts, this uh, community was, uh, was regarded as a, uh, a community that was well ahead of its time. Now, when Cushman and Stebbins met in 1857, they immediately fell in love and they would go on to live with each other for the uh, next several years. By the early 1870s, as Cushman was dying of cancer, Stebbins decided to memorialize her lover by modeling the statue's face after hers. Now, Cushman would have died by 1876, and uh, Stebbins was uh, basically really quite distraught at this whole situation, uh, that uh, she basically retired as a sculptor and would spend the next uh, several years, basically the last few years of her life, uh, writing a biography of Charlotte. Now, when she herself died not long after, uh, it was actually her wish to be buried uh, right next to Charlotte, but uh, both families, uh, of course, would not actually allow it. So a very sad story indeed. Of course, over time, the statue has evolved into something like a symbol for LGBT New Yorkers. So for example, at the height of the AIDS uh, epidemic, the playwright Tony Kushner uh, wrote Angels in America and actually set some of these scenes at Bethesda Terrace with the angel uh, itself forming a very big part of the narrative of the story, no doubt influenced by the story of uh, Emma Stebbins and Charlotte Cushman. All right, folks, so from Bethesda Terrace and Fountain, we're gonna head right on up these steps. And as you all can see, we're gonna go ahead and continue on with our tour. Uh, we're gonna first head south down uh, the mall. So, um, the Central Park Mall, of course, is famous for being this long promenade with all these lovely elm trees and statues. Since we've uh, done this walk uh, many, many times before, I won't bore you folks all the uh, specifics about the elm trees and whatnot around here. But the mall, of course, does attract quite a, a diverse crowd. And you can find all sorts of people here from all walks of life. Now, let's continue heading down and examining some of the uh, statues uh, and monuments here in this area. Now, if we uh, continue on with our walk over on our left, we can find the statue of a gentleman by the name of Fitz Green Hallett. First of all, who exactly is Fitz, uh, is Fitz Green Hallett? He's not really this popular figure anymore today in the 21st century, but back when he wasn't uh, alive in the early to mid 1800s, he was actually this major uh, figure in American literature. In fact, uh, President Lincoln himself was actually said to be a fan of uh, the work of uh, or the works of Fitzgerald Halleck. Uh, in fact, when Halleck uh, himself died in uh, 1867, something like about 15,000 people, including President uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, actually showed up uh, to uh, that ceremony uh, to unveil the statue. In fact, uh, here in this uh, image, uh, you can actually see the president himself uh, standing, uh, pulling this uh, long uh, rope or whatever, essentially unveiling this brand new statue here in Central Park. Uh, today, modern researchers are now just uh, becoming more interested in the LGBT nature of Halleck's life and work. So for example, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Drake, who was a doctor and writer and frequently collaborated uh, with Halleck on a number of different poems uh, and satirical works. They had this very intense relationship back in the 1810s that was uh, portrayed by a lot of uh, historians as this you know, extremely close friendship. Uh, when, they, uh, when Drake decided to marry a woman from a very wealthy family for the money, uh, he actually wrote that uh, he has married, and as his wife's father is rich, I imagine that he will write uh, no more. I officiated as groomsman, though much against my will. His wife was good-natured and loves him to distraction. He is perhaps the handsomest man in all of New York, a face like an angel and a form like an Apollo. Uh, of course, that, that really kind of shows you like just how much uh, emotional depth 
uh, uh, this man, Fitzgreen Halleck, really uh, had uh, in him. Of course, uh, that uh, really uh, truly allowed him to become uh, one of uh, the mid 19th century's uh, best writer uh, in all of the country. Uh, Drake himself uh, would have actually died of tuberculosis uh, at a very young age uh, in 1820. That, of course, would have affected Fitzgreen Halleck quite a bit. Um, in fact, he would have written in that very same year a poem called On the Death of Joseph Rodman Drake. Very, very heart-wrenching poem indeed. Um, throughout uh, the years, uh, Halleck never actually really forgot Joseph Drake. Um, when he died in 1867, he did actually have it in his will to uh, exhume the body of uh, Joseph Drake uh, and you know, move it uh, to uh, Fitzgreen Halleck's uh, graveyard where they would be uh, buried for all eternity. Uh, unfortunately, that never actually uh, came to pass. All right, so uh, continuing on with our walk, we're gonna go ahead and make our way uh, west from here at the mall. And uh, we're actually gonna make our way here towards a sheep meadow. And of course, it's used for picnics, sunbathing, relaxing, uh, definitely one of the more popular uh, open meadows and spaces here in Central Park. Uh, but of course, it would have seen uh, many uh, other uses throughout uh, its history. So at one point, there were actually sheep in Sheep Meadow. Uh, the sheep would have replaced the uh, uh, initial parade ground that was here in the uh, 1850s and early 1860s. And then uh, the sheep themselves uh, would remain here in this area pretty much through the 1930s, at which point in time they would be evicted uh, so to speak, towards our sister park in Brooklyn, Prospect Park. Now, by the 1960s, Sheep Meadow uh, was essentially opened up to the public who started uh, to use it for major gatherings and protests and rallies. Uh, the most famous of these gatherings were called the Central Park Be-Ins, which were very large uh, rallies against American uh, involvement in Vietnam. The beat-ins of the 1960s took a cue from the sit-ins of the civil rights era, and you start to see these emerge by 1967. Uh, by uh, 1970, the LGBT community would also start to utilize Sheep Meadow uh, for these uh, events called gay ins. Uh, the one that we're looking at right here is from 1970, and it was part of the very first Pride March, uh, which was initially called the Christopher Street uh, Liberation Day Parade, and the route, uh, route itself would have ended up uh, right here uh, at the park. Now, these gains were uh, uh, directly inspired by the be ins uh, and, uh, and the sit ins of previous generations. Of course, these rallies were uh, hugely important since they were among the first major political gatherings in the LGBT community that took place since uh, the Stonewall Uprising of the previous year. And now, during that event in June of 1969, there was, of course, this failed police raid on the Stonewall Inn, which was a, a popular gay bar and nightclub in Greenwich Village. It eventually grew into this major riot over the next few days that would eventually evolve into the modern gay rights movement uh, that we now know. Uh, this uprising was going to be led by everyday trans, uh, by everyday activists like uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, who would, of course, go on to become major activists in the transgender community. Of course, uh, it was also noted as being the uh, this major watershed moment in the history of uh, queer uh, rights. And Stonewall's impact, I think, still definitely reverberates today into the 21st century. All righty, so continuing up uh, Dead Road, uh, on our uh, next few stops, we're going to check out the Cherry Hill, and then uh, we'll end off over at Strawberry Fields. Uh, after walking through Dead Road for a little bit, we come to the Cherry Hill Fountain. Uh, Cherry Hill Fountain, uh, of course, was created by Jacob Ray Mould back in the 1860s. It was really designed as this uh, concourse for horse carriages uh, to be able to turn around. Horse could, uh, horses at that point in time could also break out of the basin of the uh, fountain as well, which, of course, uh, we can see uh, here in the image. Now, by the 1970s, the park was in this major state of dilapidation. And Cherry Hill, I think, uh, best represents you know, this uh, period in the park's history. So what was once this very vibrant section of the park that was filled with visitors and their Sunday best uh, was now mostly empty and relegated as a parking lot. Uh, by 1980, because uh, New York uh, was in such a state of de deterioration, uh, the Central Park Conservancy would be established to help restore Central Park back to life. Uh, this part of the park would be restored by folks like Philip Winslow, who we can see here uh, in the 1980s. 
Uh, Philip Winslow would have led the restoration of uh, many parks in New York City in the, in the 1970s, including parks like Gracie Mansion, uh, Battery Park, and even Christopher Park in Greenwich Village as well. Now, here in Central Park, uh, Philip Winslow would have restored the uh, uh, area around the mall, uh, the Ramble, as well as, of course, here in Cherry Hill as well. Uh, by uh, Before the uh, restoration efforts in uh, the 1970s, the park, of course, was really in this uh, you know, very visible uh, state of deterioration. So this, for example, is uh, Bethesda Terrace. Uh, so note the graffiti everywhere. You can see uh, the masonry walls are basically falling apart uh, by you know, that point in time. However, after restoration, after Philip Winslow's uh, work, today we have a very, very beautiful park. And that's thanks to all the hard work uh, of the Central Park Conservancy, the Parks Department, uh, as well as individuals like Philip Winslow. Tragically, Philip Winslow would die in 1989 of complications from uh, HIV AIDS. AIDS was, of course, a truly devastating epidemic that killed more than 8,000 New Yorkers a year at its height in the early 1990s. And because it was a disease that affected the LGBTQ community especially, uh, it was known as uh, uh, this gay plague, so to speak. Uh, Winslow also would have worked on restoring the Ramble as well uh, in the early 1980s. So the Ramble, you can see, just uh, down the pathway from Cherry Hill. Uh, today, the Ramble is uh, well known for being this uh, recreated woodland. Of course, we've uh, seen uh, the Ramble before in previous uh, weekly walks. So I won't bore you with too much of the details here. But as a woodland, the Ramble naturally provided a sense of privacy with all of its trees and rocky outcrops and winding pathways. Uh, because of this, the Ramble was popular as a gay cruising area throughout the 20th century. Cruising in this, uh, uh, in this case refers to the act of walking around a known uh, gay area and essentially soliciting for sexual activities. In a park in a city that was at the time quickly deteriorating, the Ramble was basically a free-for-all and it was a haven for a lot of uh, illicit activities, especially by the 1970s. For many gay men, however, the Ramble represented a safe space for their sexuality in a city that was increasingly hostile to their existence. Now, as a public area, the Ramble saw some police raids and, of course, uh, arrests here uh, all the time in the 20th century. Now, one of the many men that were arrested in the Ramble was actually Harvey Milk, who was the famous LGBT activist that would go on to be elected to the San Francisco City Council in the 1970s. Now, before Harvey Milk moved out west, uh, he was actually a New Yorker. And as you all can see from uh, the sign that he's holding uh, in this image, uh, he was actually... Uh, raised in Woodmere uh, in Long Island. Back in 1947, after just having graduated high school, Harvey Milk found himself uh, actually cruising in Central Park in Manhattan. And of course he would be arrested for doing so. However, the Harvey Milk connection to Central Park doesn't actually end here uh, as well. So uh, by the late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, Harvey would actually be living along Central Park West uh, and 96th Street. With a, young, uh, with a young up and coming actor by the name of Joe Campbell. Uh, Joe Campbell himself would actually go on to work with uh, Andy Warhol as one of his uh, early film stars. So there is that uh, connection uh, to the uh, LGBT community uh, here in the park. All right, folks, so we're gonna go ahead and make our way towards the last stop on our walk. And of course, now we come to what's called Strawberry Fields. Here you can find all sorts of very lovely ornamental plantings from around the world. Uh, today, of course, it's best known as a living memorial to John Lennon, who lived nearby at the Dakota building. Uh, of course, uh, very tragically, in 1980, uh, Lennon was murdered just steps away from the park in front of the Dakota building where he lived. Uh, in 1985, Yoko Ono actually donated something about a million dollars to the Conservancy to have the landscape uh, restored uh, in John's memory. Uh, Strawberry Fields itself was going to be designed by this gentleman right here on the right-hand side, uh, the landscape architect Bruce Kelly. Bruce Kelly attended Columbia University back in the 1970s, and he received a degree in historic preservation from there. He was also part of what's called the Central Park Task Force uh, in the mid to late 1970s, which is basically this uh, organization that was the precursor to the Central Park Conservancy. Now, just like his colleague, Philip Winslow, uh, Bruce, Kelly, uh, Bruce Kelly also tragically died of complications from HIV AIDS uh, in 1993. 
Uh, while he died very, very young in his uh, 40s, his efforts, of course, live on in the landscape that he designed. And today, Strawberry Fields is uh, now one of the most heavily, uh, now one of the most heavily visited areas in Central Park. Of course, in addition to his work here in the park, uh, Bruce Kelly also posthumously designed the Eleanor Roosevelt Memorial uh, in Central uh, or in uh, Riverside Park. All righty, and right up the pathway, you can see the imagined memorial to John Lennon, where, of course, it greets visitors uh, coming in from the west side. But the landscape also contains another memorial as well. So hidden amongst all the trees, the shrubs, and, of course, all the tourists, you can find uh, this lovely little plaque on one of the benches. Uh, as you folks can see, it's, of course, uh, going to be dedicated to uh, Bruce Kelly. And I think it's a very poignant tribute to the man that created uh, this landscape in the beginning. In fact, the, the uh, quote right here down at the bottom says, if you seek my monument, look around. All righty, folks. So now we've reached 72nd Street, and this is where we will part ways for today. But to recap, the park was designed as an open democratic space since the very beginning. And it was perhaps because of this inclusionary tradition that Central Park really evolved into a popular social space for queer folks by the 20th century. Today, there are enormous challenges ahead for the LGBT community. And in an area in which basic human rights can be easily struck down by the courts, now I think is the best time to reaffirm our support for all of our queer friends, family, and neighbors all across the city, country, and the planet. All right, folks, so that does it for this week's walk. Don't forget to check out the Pride in Central Park uh, guided tour tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, Desiree, uh, Desiree is going to leave the uh, link for that uh, in the chat section. Uh, and of course, you can also uh, check us out on all of our social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And of course, you can also check us out on YouTube as well. Uh, if you check the uh, chat, uh, Desiree will also leave uh, the uh, link uh, for our YouTube channel where you'll be able to uh, rewatch uh, this and other uh, weekly walks and virtual programs. Again, thank you all so much for joining us uh, on our weekly walk. Uh, from all of us here at the Conservancy, stay safe and be well. Have a good day, folks.